we move back in time to the early modern period with two of the very best people that could take us to that area. Uh, the main talk on early modern literature and the mind of Europe with, this, with a particular angle and example is going to be given by Victoria Moule. Victoria Moule is Associate Professor of Neo-Latin and English at University College. I'm guessing the only person in the world with that exact job title. Um, and she's already eminent in that field of Neo-Latin as a classical reception more broadly. She's spoken about, um, she's written about many, many uh, topics in classical reception, but with a special commitment to the study of Neo-Latin. She's edited CUP Guide to Modern, uh, Guide to Neo-Latin Literature, that came out in 2017. And she's bringing a lot of these things together as head of a team for a very ambitious Leverhulme project uh, on Neo-Latin poetry in English manuscript first miscellanies, which is about to be completed. Um, and as her former colleague at King's College London, uh, I know full well that you're going to be in for a really incisive talk from Victoria Moore today. In answer, we've got uh, the ideal interlocutor, Colin Burrow uh, of All Souls and Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Oxford, will be known to all of you for a whole string of studies which link classical tradition and especially early modern literature, but not only, uh, together. And so like Victoria Moore, he's genuinely ambidextrous or amphibious. Everyone will know, for example, his monograph, Shakespeare and Classical Antiquity. Um, not everyone will have got round to reading, but now surely will. Uh, his 2019 book, Imitating Authors, Plato to Futurity, where he looks at this question of literary imitation on a wide scale. And that's really the heart of the um, area we're going to be looking at in today's session. So as usual, many of you are old timers, but some of you have come on for the first time. As usual, just to say how we do it, our two speakers will speak uninterrupted for a total of about 25 minutes. And that part of the session will be recorded on the APGRD uh, YouTube channel. So you can just play that back for your delectation or tell people who couldn't be there in real time to do so. Um, then we'll break for 10 minutes and your two conveners will put their heads together um, just to think about what order of questions would be most appropriate for the question and answer session to follow. And that isn't going to be recorded. So in that 10 minutes, you could make coffee, hapless to try and find out which COVID tier you're in or whatever. And as soon as questions strike you, even during the talks, you can just feed them into the chat function on Zoom and we'll make sure that they're collated and that as many of the questions get responses as possible. So we're in for a very interesting pair of talks today. I'm going to pass you right over with no further patter to Victoria Moole. Over to you, Victoria. Hello, thank you, David and Fiona. I'm going to try and share my screen. Oh, uh, uh, okay, the host has disabled attendee screen sharing. Could that be turned on, please? And then I can share the slides. You should be able to now. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay, so you should now be able to see the slideshow, hopefully. Um, so thank you very much to David and Fiona for the invitation to speak and to Colin for being my respondent. Um, I should say those of you who saw the advertised title that this was originally going to be a paper more about Protestant Latin poetics than it is. And um, when I suggested that title, I was, um, I was mistaken. I thought it was a longer talk than it is. So it's now only rather implicitly about Protestant Latin poetics, although we could maybe come back to that in the questions at the end. Um, so I work mainly on the relationship between English poetry and contemporary Latin poetry in early modernity. And this is a series of talks, isn't it, on classical reception. And it's true that the study of post-classical Latin as a whole, so including medieval as well as early modern Latin, um, has tended to sit at a bit of an odd angle to the mainstream study of classical reception. 
Despite the obvious cultural centrality of classical language and literature in those periods, classical reception has tended to focus mostly on later periods, mainly on the literature and broader culture of the 19th century onwards. So on the one hand, I obviously tend to think that this is a shame and that there's a major need for Latinists above all to explore the vast wealth of Latin literature, which dates from after antiquity. That is the huge, huge majority of extant Latin. On the other hand, I also think it's true that the importation of typically classicist assumptions and perspective to the study of early modern Latinity has in practice done quite a lot of damage. So I want, I suppose, to think about both those things today. Early modern literary culture here in England as elsewhere in Europe uh, was a bilingual culture in which constant production as well as consumption, so writing as well as reading went on of literature in Latin as well as the vernacular and in which Latin literature was, we might say, a going concern, site of innovation and creativity. Uh, we don't, do we, expect a poet writing even on a conventional theme to do so in the same way, in the same style, in 1580 as he might in 1660. And indeed, everything we learn as students of literature is to be sensitive to the differences between, say, Sidney and Cowley or Tennyson and Eliot. The same is just as true of Latin poetry in early modernity, but you would still be really hard pressed to find a single reference work that clearly acknowledges this. Latin poetry, just like vernacular poetry, was the site of waves of formal and stylistic innovation. And this was particularly so during the period that we usually call early modern. Now, those of us who are lucky enough to be native English speakers are used, aren't we, to operating with that rather complacent sense of the significance of English as a world language and the likelihood that anything we write in English will be widely understood. Of course, in early modernity, English was not at all an international language. Even English and Scots speakers could have significant difficulties understanding one another. The international language was Latin and Latin was also the medium as well as the main subject of instruction at school and university in England as it was in France, Germany, Poland, Scandinavia, wherever. Boys at school were taught in Latin from an upper primary stage and they learned whatever other subjects they acquired, Greek or Hebrew, via Latin. There are really interesting parallels here with the use of English and some other world languages for secondary and tertiary education uh, in some parts of the world today. And given that the Latin medium school system of early modernity produced arguably the best 150 years of English poetry, this certainly raises really fascinating questions about the connection between educational bilingualism and creativity. Um, these questions seem to me particularly pressing because I'm governor of a primary school in Archway in central London, a primary school which has around 70% um, of its children eligible for free school meals. Um, that's comparable to a national average of about 17%. So this is one of the most deprived intakes in the country. And it has children who speak 36 different languages at home. This is a small, very small primary school. And um, so very many of these children are experiencing a version of what Shakespeare experienced every day when he went to school and switching languages each morning at the school gate. Um, so this question about the relationship between multilingualism and creativity is a really interesting one. Um, but the point more relevant for our purposes today is that when early modern poets read poetry from other European countries, they mostly did so in Latin. Latin was by far the most straightforward conduit for technical or formal innovation, and conversely this also explains why we see certain generic and formal conventions in early modern poetry which are not necessarily classical, but which were plainly widely understood and adopted across Europe. It's therefore a really odd feature of the still relatively small amount of specifically neo-Latin, I hate the word neo-Latin, early modern Latin scholarship, that it has tended to focus on individual countries. I think in practice this is just an accident of the ways in which most scholars in the field have tried to carve out a little bit of space within their work um, to work on this material, um, since almost no one um, has, as I'm lucky enough to do, a job which actually includes early modern Latin in its title. But nevertheless, it is a really perverse outcome, since early modern Latin literature is by its nature by far the most genuinely international literature of the period. In 1580, what's going on in Latin in England is by and large much closer to what's going on in Latin in other European countries than it is to anything that was going on in English, at least if we're thinking about poetry. And we see this demonstrated at all levels, for instance, by the European wide reputation of Latin poets very far removed geographically and culturally from one another, such as John Owen in Wales, and by far the most famous British author in Protestant Europe in the 17th century, a point when no one had heard of Shakespeare, of course, but even Johnson, I think, would have had pretty much zero name recognition on the continent. Um, or someone like Kazimierz Sarbiewski, Polish Jesuit poet. Um, for both of these authors, there was a veritable craze at certain points um, in the 17th century. We see it also in the contemporary or near contemporary Latin texts that were taught in schools across Europe and individual lives and careers. 
So time and again in manuscript sources or reading print prefaces carefully, we see migrant or exile poets washed up in one place, promptly finding ways to survive by writing tactful Latin verse, sometimes demonstrably before they had any functioning mastery of the local vernacular. So for instance, French and Italian Protestants in England, sad English royalists in France, um, also much further flung examples like Polish Protestants, for instance, in different parts of Western Europe. And this is a lovely example in the BL. Uh, this is a manuscript belonging to a Danish guy, Herland. Um, the great majority of this manuscript just consists of Latin poems that he's writing for various patrons or hoped for patrons. Um, around the middle of the manuscript, he, he moves to London and continues seamlessly writing uh, Latin poems for people that he hopes might give him some money. Um, but there are a few pages right in the middle of this. Uh, this is him learning English, as you can see. These are um, attempting to learn strong verbs in English, bind, bound, and so on, bring, brought. Um, so at this point, he has um, relatively little English himself. So if we want to understand early modern literary culture, we have to think bilingually. And this is particularly the case if we want to do any serious work at an international or transnational rather than simply local level. Um, but this is, isn't it, this is rather a sort of abstract point. So I thought, even though we don't know very long, um, it would be helpful to talk briefly about a single example. I'm very hard to choose, but I decided to talk a bit about Marvel's poem, um, his Horatian Ode on Cromwell's return from Ireland. Um, partly because, because this is a very famous poem, um, even if you're not an early modernist, you might well have read it. It's also a very familiar case of classical reception, and it's produced some really important readings in its own right, um, by Eliot, Sisson, Blair Warden, David Norbrook, more recently. Um, of course, it's also just a really, really good poem, so worth thinking about it. If you haven't read it, it's famous for its political ambiguity, seeming both to genuinely praise Cromwell and to genuinely lament the execution of Charles I in 1649. The poem dates almost certainly from the following year, 1650, although there is notoriously no um, very good evidence for its circulation at the time. Okay, so these are the opening lines of this poem. The forward youth that would appear must now forsake his muses dear, nor in the shadows sing his numbers languishing. It is time to leave the books in dust and oil the unused armour's rust, removing from the wall the corslet of the hall. So restless Cromwell could not cease in the inglorious arts of peace, but through adventurous war urged his active star. Uh, so this poem has frequently been described as one of the best, if not the best, English Horatian ode and has been widely hailed for the originality of its form and tone. Typical commentary, however, um, tends to locate specific, a sort of series of specific allusions to Horace and some other authors, but has generally been vague about the cultural valency and familiarity of related forms at the time. What I mean by that, I suppose, is questions about how such a poem would have been read as well as how and from what sources it was written. Most importantly, discussions of the Horatianism of the poem are focused almost exclusively upon Horace himself and frequently relate the poem primarily to contemporary translations of Horace's odes, of which there are a few, although I think their literary significance has been much exaggerated. The assumption that an Horatian lyric form suggests or alludes directly and indeed only to Horace probably strikes most of you, if you've thought about it at all, as reasonable, if not outright obvious. But this is a really good example of where we go seriously wrong if we think as modern classicists rather than as an early modernist. Now it's perfectly true that as far as the average well-trained classical Latinist today is concerned, Latin odes in the meters Horace uses are for all intents and purposes limited to poems Horace actually wrote. So there are one or two examples of Sapphics and Catullus for instance and a few more scattered lyric meters in the sort of silver or later Latin texts that aren't taught much at all like Statius's Silvi, Seneca's Choruses, Boethius or Prudentius. But there aren't any other kind of complete classical collections of lyric using these originally Greek meters and modern classic students are quite unlikely to encounter any Latin poem in, for instance, Alcaics or Asclepiads, which is not by Horace. But the situation was entirely different for any educated reader or poet in the 17th century. Latin lyric in Horatian meters was an absolutely standard verse form, the composition of which was taught at school, and anyone who'd stuck out of grammar school until even mid-adolescence would have had to churn out at least a few examples. This is one of billions of potential examples, 1594 Ludlow School Collection. I include it because it nicely demonstrates that um, the ways in which you wrote a metrical diagram in 1594 are absolutely identical to how you would do it today. That's the uh, first Asclepiad. Um, so anyone writing or reading any quantity of Latin verse encountered Horatian odes, which were not by Horace, vastly more often than they read Horace themselves, however keen an admirer of Horace they might have been. The sheer frequency of this type of composition is clear, both from the manuscript and the print record. 
Uh, so, for instance, from my uh, database of around 28,000 post medieval Latin poems in English manuscript sources, uh, a few over 2,000 are in lyric meters, that's about a one in 14, and a further 1,000 are in iambic meters, um, also an important um, uh, Neo Latin poetic tradition derived ultimately from Horace. Any full scale analysis of Anglo Latin poetry in print uh, still remains to be um, even begun, let alone done. Um, but if we think just about the university commemorative anthologies, for instance, uh, which are quite nice representative because inevitably they, they tend to reflect what's kind of in vogue um, to quite a large extent. Of the 39 between 1587 and 1660, we find no examples that do not contain formal odes in Horatian lyric meters. Um, and many of the collections have um, over 10% in these forms. Uh, in general, they peak in the late 16th, the very early 17th century. So that's the kind of Johnsonian moment really. And then again, after the mid 1630s, and that's essentially a post Sarbievsky moment, I think. Um, this is Aliwa Parkis um, for Cromwell in 1654. And she has a particularly large proportion, 11 out of 58. Um, not my point today, but demonstrating the continuity um, of the kinds of things that were produced for Cromwell as for the King. And Marvel himself had contributed to one of these collections in the 1640s. So if we speak about the composition of an Horatian ode, such as Marvel's, this should not therefore be taken, as it generally has been, to mean a poem modelled only upon Horace. Horatian at this period is a generic and a formal category, as much, if not more, as an authorial one. I mean, it's more like saying love elegy or epic than it is like saying to Bullen or Homeric. And so what difference does this make to our understanding of Marvel's achievement? I don't know very long to cover this, but we could, for instance, think about features of Marvel's poem that are not typical of Horace, actually, but are typical of the Neo-Latin ode. One, and this sounds like a bit of an abstract point, but it's actually an important one, is that it basically stays on message. Uh, Marvel's poem more or less um, ends up where it begins. That sounds like something you might expect a poem to do, but one of the least imitable features of Horatian lyric is actually how rarely Horace's odes do end where they begin, um, whereas the great majority of Neo-Latin odes do. If we think about its length, um, Marvel's poem is 120 lines, which is much longer than any bit of Horace. The longest Horatian ode is only 80 lines long, that's odes three, four, and most of them are much shorter. Uh, but for instance, Janus Deuce's collection from 1586, the longest ode um, in this collection is 204 lines long, several others are over 150. This is a particularly important collection in England, um, this is a Dutch poet, um, but you can see this collection of odes was addressed to Elizabeth. And many of Sarbievsky's um, very influential political odes are also very long. Another aspect we could think about is that several critics have remarked on the use of kind of gnomic features, so very excertable, quotable little sententiae within Marvel's Ode, uh, which is not terribly typical of Horatian lyric at, in Horace himself. And this has led Stella Rivard, for instance, to describe the poem as indebted more to Pindar than Horace. Uh, this is a really perverse conclusion, though, since although it's true about the text of Horace versus the text of Pindar, such sententiae are a completely standard feature of formal political Latin ode by the time Marvel was writing. So that is the kind of Neo-Latin Horatian ode as a genre. And I've just put a few examples from um, Marvel's ode on the left and from uh, Neo-Latin uh, political odes on the right, um, from Duza, whom I've just mentioned, Melville's Gunpowder Plot Ode, and then two from Gage's uh, Parry Plot collection that we will come back to in a minute. Indeed, many early modern Latin odes, quite unlike anything in Horace, consist of strings of moralizing motifs of this kind. Another feature of Marvel's Ode, which has been the focus of comment, is its nuanced politics and its interest in the kind of perspective of the defeated, uh, most famously, of course, in the sympathy for the king, but also in terms of the external perspective of defeated enemies. They can affirm his praises best and have their overcome, confessed how good he is, how just and fit for highest trust. This is, of course, a panegyric topos, and the praise from the defeated is particularly powerful. But Marvel's interest in the perspective on England from abroad um, seems quite original when you get to Marvel because there haven't been that many examples of this kind of thing in formal political lyric before that point. Um, if we're reading only in English and we're thinking about English Horatianism, then we tend to think of the kind of cavalier lyrics of the 1630s and 40s and Marvel's poem is certainly very far removed from them. But that kind of Horatianism, the cavalier lyric, kind was never the dominant one in Anglo-Latin or in Neo-Latin as a whole, and it barely exists at all before about 1620. It comes in via Sarbevsky, Balder, and other Catholic um, Horatian authors, I think. This kind of nuanced political perspective is often linked to Horatian odes like uh, the Cleopatra Ode, and it certainly is found in Horace, but it's also completely typical of all sophisticated political lyric in Latin, at least since the 1580s in England. 
Um, so this uh, really fantastic poem, for instance, by um, Thomas Bastard um, on the death of Sydney. And the entire poem is just about how Sydney was perceived by others. Here we have Belgium looking upon you like Priam looked upon tall Agamemnon, and in the same way did Ulysses once look upon the palm tree in the temple of Apollo, flourishing with beautiful flowers and tender leaves. That last comparison in particular, um, extremely subtle because that moment in the Odyssey is actually a recollection. Um, Odysseus remembers um, that palm tree when he sees now Sakae on the beach. So there's a kind of overlay of eroticism there, which is not irrelevant to many of the ways in which Sydney is depicted. We find the same idea of the perception of the enemy in Payne Fisher's Ode to Cromwell, written probably very shortly after Marvels. You, the harsh Scot, the wandering people of Ireland, you, the ridges of rattling Cambria, and all our world far and wide, your strength and might and wisdom long since have acknowledged. The foreigner shall experience your power, any foreign region which threatens English losses, whether he shall rouse new or rekindle old uh, angers. Those of you who know Marvel's poem very well will recall, and now the Irish are ashamed to see themselves in one year tamed, and the Pict, that's the Scot, no shelter now shall find within his party-coloured mind. There's one final aspect of Marvel's poem that I'd like to highlight, and that's the self-consciousness of the way it marks a change from peace to war, from the king to Cromwell, but also in the poet himself. And because those ambiguous opening lines that refer to the forward youth are most naturally taken, I think, as you begin to read the poem, to refer to the poet himself and to represent a sort of a kind of recusatio where you reject one kind of poetry and you turn to another, um, either perhaps from you know, love poetry to epic or abandoning poetry altogether in time of war. The pressure of events forces any forward youth to abandon poetry and that same pressure of events acts upon Cromwell. In 1641, Cambridge poets had marked the narrow, and it turned out rather short-lived, avoidance of war with Irenaidia Cantabrigiensis, um, a large collection of uh, Latin verse, and the opening of the longest Latin ode by Peter Samways, who was a fellow of Trinity, Marvel was still at Trinity indeed in 1641, um, is a kind of mirror image of the beginning of Marvel's poem. Um, it's a much less interesting poem than Marvel's, um, but it's doing the same kind of thing. I was planning to write about war because that's what I thought was coming, that's what I thought was needed, but now suddenly I've been told, you know, the goddess has intervened and told me that's not what I should be doing. Marvel's poem confronts the reversal of this happy scenario. The forward youth of 1650 rather than 1641 must find a way to celebrate not peace, but now war. Such a setting hints at if it does not directly confront the poet's own change of heart. And this theme, interestingly implicit in Marvel, is taken up explicitly at the opening of Fisher's really remarkable poem on basically the same subject. What force has overwhelmed me or with its persuasive power enticed me to a change of heart? Why has my will now borne my inconstant desires back to a firmer foundation? To be sure I or Horace was until recently a deserving follower, but in a vain cause. Our disaster has swayed me to you, our disaster and your famous virtue. Uh, astonishingly kind of honest poem says why do I now support you Cromwell well in part because uh, we have lost. Fisher is here like Marvel drawing on a tradition of political Latin lyric which engages directly with the ambiguities and compromises for the poet in writing public poetry. Um, here is William Gager also very self-consciously changing his mind in one of the sequences of odes on the Parry plot published in 1586. Um, so I feel pity for you Tichburn and I feel pity for Salisbury these are the conspirators um, but a few lines later, I've changed my mind, Tichborne. Now I have no pity on your youth, nor that of Salisbury. Although there's a hint of doubt here. You, my country, please make me severe. So please sort of strengthen my resolve in my change of heart. So Marvel's Horatian Ode is, of course, inconceivable without Horace. But its scope, tone and rhetorical strategies, its length and consistency, the use of sententiae, the opening hint of recusatio, or a change of genre, the sympathy for and voice of the defeated, the outward facing emphasis upon how the English nation performs and is seen abroad, and the real patriotism of the poem are all shaped as much by the neo Latin lyric tradition as they are by Horace himself. Thank you. Many thanks for that very lucid talk, and straight over now to our respondent, Colin Burrow. Thank you very much indeed, um, Victoria. And um, I mean, there are a couple of particularly valuable points in that enormously rich talk, I thought. Um, the first one is the, the sort of key point that in the process of imitating an author, an author 
ceases to be just a body of text or indeed an individual author and becomes a genre. So oration means more than uh, a text that derives from Horace. It means one that pulls in texts associated with a wider oration project. And I thought a lot of the specific examples were extremely compelling, particularly the uh, connections with Payne Fisher. Um, what I have to say is really a, a footnote to what Victoria was saying about Marvel and bilingualism and bilingualism generally. And I thought I'd say a little bit more about Marvel's Latin poems, um, just to sort of fill in that side of his career, because they tend to be very neglected and they are, I think, a very important part of his overall output. It is a very miscellaneous collection, um, even for a very miscellaneous poet like Marvel. Um, and depending on how you count them, there are two or three poems that exist in both Latin and English versions. There's the Drop of Dew, which has a sort of parallel Latin poem called Ros, and then there's the Garden that has a parallel poem called Hortus, and then there's the Hill and Grove of Bilborough, which has a Latin epigram uh, on the same topic. And I'd, I'd be inclined to see these, as Estelle Hahn does, as being more or less a group of poems which derive from Marvel's period at Nun Appleton when he was tutor to Maria Fairfax. So the fully bilingual poems, I mean, the poems that exist both in English and in Latin, are likely to originate, I think, from a pedagogical setting, in which a tutor is encouraging an elite female pupil to think in two languages at once. And there's a very good essay on them by Estelle Hahn in, in, in the Oxford Handbook um, of Marvel. Um, and she shows how those poems, in various ways, tease out the resources of both English and Latin. Uh, by interlinguistic puns, so the Latin poem puns on Ros and Rosa, uh, but they also make the very name Fairfax, beautiful torch, a kind of macaronic pun. And I think they are worth thinking of as pedagogical. They're saying really, think how this poem in this language could become that poem in that language. And they're also designed to show how each pair of poems that exists in two languages can sort of delicately remember or recall the other language. So the, 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 the resources are, are sort of mutually enforcing. Now, that aspect of these Latin poems might see, make them seem very small in relation to a dramatic public performance like the Horatian Ode, but I don't think they are that small. Um, and Nigel Smith in his um, substantial uh, edition of Marvel's poems, from 2003, is very keen actually to detach these poems from the Appleton House period, um, partly because he doesn't want Marvel to be the introverted garden dwelling tutor come mystery man of traditional criticism. He wants him to be political, to be European, and perhaps um, in a stereotypically way, a stereotypi stereotypi stereotypical way, manly. And the garden, and Hortus in particular, Smith dates to the 1660s. On what I'd regard as a rather dubious foundation of apparent echoes um, in them of poems by Catherine Phillips and others. I, th I think to see the bilingual Maria poems as sort of small scale as needing to be sp spread out across Marvel's career is I think to misunderstand the power and the significance of apparently small scale relationships like that between a tutor and a female pupil. Because Marvel, Marvel is, of course, the great poet of making small things seem big and vice versa. That's the sort of optical trick of a Pon Appleton house. And he was, in many respects, an aggressively and programmatically provincial writer, actually, too, as well as an international one. But his provinciality tended always to have a wider resonance. So in 1650, he wrote uh, both an English poem and a Latin poem to praise Robert Whitty for translating James Primrose's popular errors into English. Now, to write a Latin poem on any vernacular translation of a Latin original might seem just a tiny bit perverse, but to write a Latin dedicatory poem to a translation of a Latin work which is about vulgar errors seems not just a bit, bit perverse, but actually wildly perverse. It appears to reverse the flow of the translation itself away from the vulgar tongue and back into Latin. And the Latin poem to Witty also uses an international language to pay what is an extraordinarily localized compliment. Robert Witty was a surgeon in Marvel's native Hull. So, uh, and the English poem to Witty 
is slightly different and much actually broader in focus. It talks much more directly about the work of translation. It says, some in this task take off the Cyprus veil, but leave a mask, changing the Latin, but do more obscure that sense in English, which was bright and pure. And the English poem refers to someone called Celia, who learns the tongues of France and Italy, but is Celia still. And Celia is a figure of perfectly transparent multilingualism, and she's usually taken as another reference to Maria Fairfax. And that again would situate Marvel's interests in multilingualism in a sort of domestic and intimate and small scale relationship. And again, Nigel Smith argues against the view that this is a reference to Mar Marvel's duty, Maria Fairfax, since he's so very keen to make his Marvel operating what he sees as a wider, properly political sphere. But whether Celia is Maria or not, the bilingual poems are haunted by Maria Fairfax. So the Latin epigram um, in Duos Montes, Amos Clevum, unlike its English companion poem On the Hill and Grove at Bilbra, directly mentions Maria by name. She's part of the interlinguistic landscape. She's part of the audience of these poems and a vital central part of the audience of these poems. And I suppose the question then is, how do these bilingual poems relate to that terrifying uh, 1920s-ish abstraction, the mind of Europe? Well, I suppose the Smith approach, as we might call it, would be to say that they're not just schoolroom exercises, but they belong to different periods of Marvel's activities, and so they are bigger than they might seem. And Smith's Marvel is a serious and internationalist uh, poet, a political writer who's often thinking about relations with the wider world, and particularly uh, Anglo-Dutch political relationships. And so teaching a woman how to think in two languages at the same time just isn't perhaps big enough to really matter to him. And I think that view of Marvel's bilingualism is mistaken and that it's a much richer resource than Smith would imply. And it leads also on to a wider question uh, too. Why are we not supposed to find something big and grand like the mind of Europe at work in the bilingual exchanges between a learned poet and a female pupil? I think it's important to ask that question because it draws attention to other ways of thinking about Marvel's more public Latin poems, ways which embed them in a much more granular society than um, commentators have often done. And his more public Latin poems include epitaphs and epistles, which might seem very different in their audience and their mode of proceeding from what we might call the Maria Fairfax group. But actually, those more public poems are less different in their approach, I think, and much more multilingual in the way in which the Maria poems are than might first appear. So the poem on the legation of Oliver St. John, uh, Smith argues, was written in order to win employment with the new government, i.e. not only is that poem about the serious diplomatic exchanges between England and the Dutch Republics in 1651, it's also couched in the language of international diplomacy and is trying to get out into Europe and to get Marvel a proper job. But I think it's really important to remember that the internationalism of Latin poetry in this period was also, if you'll forgive this really crappy word for it, interpersonalism. That's to say the internationalism of Latin poetry in this period depended on personal contacts and on influences. And you can see that particularly actually in the relationships between people like Dusa and Elizabeth I, who's writing odes for the Queen, very specifically targeted at her to get under her skin as part of a, a wider diplomatic venture. And it, Latin poetry therefore is tied up not just in a whole range of other neo-Latin writing, but also in personal contacts and influences between individuals. It grew from friendships and local intimacies on exchanges of letters and chance meetings. So the kind of interpersonal and interlinguistic skills that Marvel was using in what I call the Maria group of Latin poems were actually completely transferable to a wider European stage. Indeed, in a way, they were the foundation of his internationalism. If you learn how to talk to a female uh, pupil, you also learn how to talk to queens. 
And the key example here, I suppose, is Marvel's poems to Queen Christina of Sweden. And those are little masterpieces about how to be English, but at the same time, how to talk seductively in Latin across na national boundaries. Um, so the letter to Dr. Ingelo, Ingelo, is ingelidized in Sweden, freezing, um, while Christina is flattered as a true heir of Elizabeth I. And again, pointing back, I think, pretty explicitly to the kinds of uh, diplomatic poetic uh, exchanges between the Low Countries and Elizabeth I through the work of Dusa and also Daniel Rogers uh, in the late 16th century. And Ma um, Ma Marvel, Marvel's address in this poem via the intermediary of his friend Ingelo um, is to an elite female readership. And that should remind us that 17th century international politics is a matter of interpersonal and interlinguistic play. These aren't political or, or diplomatic poems as distinct from pedagogical bilingual poems to Maria. They're a very similar sort of performance. They're wheedling, they're punning, they're creating international relationships through building up personal and linguistic contacts. So what might this tell us about the mind of Europe in the 17th century? Um, well, in thinking about the mind of Europe in the 17th century, I think we have to be prepared to find it in surprising places. Um, it's not there like some great brooding cultural monolith to which everyone paid homage and of which all men and probably only men were a part. It's actually played out tra transactionally and played out within the exchanges between a male tutor and a female tu tutee and between a male diplomat and a learned queen. It's there in self-effacing puns on national identities and languages. And it can come through in polite interplays between men and women across languages and nations. And I think there are profound gains as well as some losses in thinking about the mind of Europe in this way. We might lose the idea, which was so beloved of critics who came of age in the 1980s, that it's only when overtly doing high politics that poets contribute to a wider public sphere. We have to qualify that um, perspective, I think. But in doing that, what we gain is something that amply offsets the loss, because we gain the notion that even in apparently low level exchanges between languages, the mind of Europe is, as it were, building interconnections, building communicative bridges, doing interpersonal diplomacy. And we also gain the really vital idea that the mind of Europe isn't to be found only in diplomatic bags or on the floors of debating chambers. It's also to be found and perhaps also may constructed word by word by intertextual exchanges, by byplay between pupils and teachers and in multilingual exchanges between men and women across nations. And I think Victoria's fantastic talk about the Horatian Ode has really brought our, our gaze towards the way in which even these uh, vernacular performances by Marvel are embedded in those kinds of low level, relatively speaking, uh, exchanges between uh, academic disputes, disputants in volumes of university verses, for example, or in uh, performances, uh, poetic performances of Horatian odes uh, composed by Neo-Latin poets for Elizabeth I. And I thought it was a wonderful talk and I learned a great deal from it. And I look forward very much to the discussion in due course. Thank you. <laughs>